I want to start by just reviewing the U.S. Preventative uh, Services Task Force. So as you all recall, in 2012, they came out with a recommendation of level D for uh, prostate screening. And last year, they had a revised recommendation. It's only still in draft form, but they've bumped us up from a D to a C. Uh, you know, we're slowly moving up there. I think, you know, as we all know, prostate cancer, I think is a, it's a real event. And um, this is the 19, uh, 2017 statistics. And with respect to new diagnosis, it's the number one new diagnosis in men in 2017. And I'm sorry, I don't think the pointer up here is working. So let me use this. And um, with respect to deaths, it's the number three cause of deaths uh, for men in 2017. The recommendations that were made by the U.S. Preventative Task Force was greatly influenced by two papers, both published in 2009 in New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, this was the mortality results from a randomized prostate cancer screening trial, uh, the PLCO project. And this paper demonstrated no mortality benefit for annual screening. There was a problem that there was a uh, contamin there was contamination of the control group. 50% uh, or so of the men had P prior PSA testing. Uh, this data has been updated in 2017, and I'm sure Dr. Andrew All will be presenting it. The other paper, uh, also published in 2009, was the European version: screening and prostate cancer mortality in a, random a randomized European study. They did report a 20% reduction in prostate cancer mortality in men ages 55 to 69, but it was estimated that you had to screen 1,410 men to treat 48 for every uh, prostate cancer death averted. So people felt as though the risk-benefit ratio was not there. Uh, this, also, uh, this data set was also updated in 2012, so two additional years were um, brought in. It, in fact, dropped the number of men that needed to be screened and the number of men treated down uh, it did show decreased mortality, uh, but it did not have an impact on all-cause mortality. This is the PIVOT trial. This was published in 2012, and the PIVOT trial uh, also uh, demonstrated that RRP did not significantly reduce all-cause or prostate cancer mortality through 12 years of follow-up. But when you do a subset analysis of this data, and so you look at deaths from prostate cancer, there was a benefit to radical prostatectomy in men who had a PSA greater than 10 and in men with intermediate to high grade disease. So this leads us to believe that I think, you know, one of our problems is that we overtreated prostate cancer. This is our responsibility, our burden. And unfortunately, this has influenced the recommendations from the U.S. Preventative Task Force. So the controversy to me surrounding prostate cancer and screening is based on our inability to detect clinically significant prostate cancer. We can't treat all men the same way. This, when I was training, was our paradigm. We screen, we diagnosed, and we overtreat it. How many men have you treated who had Gleason 6 disease and on final pathology were P0? I had a couple of them. Obviously, I didn't help them. And so I think we need to retreat, we need to rethink our paradigm. So we don't screen to treat, we screen to detect and then determine who to treat. And that will give us a better, um, I think, value proposition to the patient. The problem is our current standard. Unfortunately, it's based on transrectal ultrasound, uh, it's poor sensitivity and specificity for cancer. The bottom line is, as I tell patients, we use it just to find the prostate, and then we take 12 random cores of the prostate. There is no other solid organ in the body that in order to detect cancer, we do it randomly. As I mentioned, I tell patients all the time, imagine someone had, we suspect you have breast cancer, we're gonna take 12 cores of your breast, there's nothing seen, or this is what we saw, therefore this is what you have. It makes no sense. We also know that the random biopsies are very limited. Rarely truly systematic. So this was a study done at Hopkins, and they basically had a um, ex vivo uh, uh, model. And the gold standard would be systematic biopsy or the, in green. The expectation is that you're systematically targeting various regions of the prostate. They then had uh, subjects actually perform a transrectal ultrasound biopsy, and the red dots show what was actually done. So you can see there's huge errors in what is actually sampled by a transrectal ultrasound biopsy. It's a game of chance, 12 cores sample, only about 0.45% of a 40 cc gland, misses 30% of cancers, and in understages, 33% of cancers. Uh, this was my mentor, and this was a lecture he gave in 2009. He said the discovery that would have the greatest impact on our field would be the development of accurate imaging of tumor within the prostate. Interestingly, MRI for prostate cancer was described in 1983. Um, however, we now know that uh, it's taken on as a role. It's our best modality that we have to look for cancer within the prostate. It's based on three phases, a T2-weighted imaging phase, diffusion-weighted, and dynamic contrast-enhanced. 
We also now have a standardization of MRI reading, which improves our scoring and reproducibility. And this is the uh, prostate imaging reporting and data system, PIRADS. This is version two that was published and uh, it was put together by the consortium in 2015 and published by Jeff Weinrab uh, in European Urology in 2016. PIRADS one, very low, it's a negative MRI. PIRADS two, low, clinically significant cancer is unlikely to be present. Three is intermediate. Four is high, so clinically significant cancer is likely to be present, and very high, PIRADS 5, significant cancer is highly likely to be present. So it's really the PIRADS 4 and 5 lesions that I think we try to focus in on. MRI-targeted biopsies can be done three ways. You can do in-bore MRI-targeted. You can do cognitive registration, look at the MRI, do the ultrasound, and in your head try to figure out where the target is, and then software fusion. There are limitations to the inbore. It's expensive, time-consuming, special equipment, and sometimes uh, general anesthesia is required. There are multiple devices on the market currently today for doing MR ultrasound fusion. Um, our, um, the, the one that we use at Yale and where uh, I came from UCLA is the Eigen Artemis uh, device. So MR ultrasound fusion for the prostate, it combines the strength of both modalities. So you have lesion identification on the multiparametric MRI. You then register or fuse that MR image to our 3D ultrasound um, image that's obtained by the ultrasound probe transrectally, and then you're guided to the lesions by the ultrasound. This was a meta-analysis by Tyson Urologic Oncology. They looked at the performance characteristics of MR ultrasound fusion in the detection of prostate cancer. So they were looking at sensitivity of uh, detection of significant cancer, and you can see regardless of the device used, Artemis, Euronav, or Cognitive, they actually had a detection rate of eight, a sensitivity of 82 to 96 percent. This is a paper that was published in JAMA by Peter Pinto and the group at NCI looking at um, performance of different biopsy approaches in the detection of intermediate to high-grade cancer. And what they found when they compared targeted to standard, the sensitivity and the accuracy of the targeted uh, was significantly better than standard alone. This is the device we use, the Artemis. So you have a robotic, I call it a robotic arm, that holds the ultrasound device that uh, we use to obtain the 3D ultrasound. It's connected to a, uh, the arm, it has a tracker, and then it has a computer interface. The workflow, patient undergoes an MRI. There's usually about a seven to 10 day um, difference between the MRI and the exam. So the exam is then read by the radiologist. It undergoes segmentation. They create a 3D model. They, they identify the regions of interest. That is then incorporated into the Artemis device. Patient then undergoes a 3D ultrasound. The ultrasound image and the MRI image are fused. And now under ultrasound guidance, you can target those lesions. This is the workflow, just uh, what's seen on the screen. So this is the delineation of a region of interest on an MRI. Now you have the 3D ultrasound, or the ultrasound, you fuse the MRI, and you can identify your lesion within the ultrasound, by ultrasound, and it can be targeted. So I want to quickly review our experience with the Artemis device, looking at our patient cohort. Our program began uh, when I arrived at, UC, uh, at Yale from UCLA. Um, I arrived there in January, and we started the program in December of 2012. We've enrolled over 1,000 men. 85% have targeted biopsies. So about 15% of the men that undergo this actually have a negative MRI. And we do about six to 12 cases a week. 900, so, and the data that I'm gonna present now is just on a subset of those 981 patients. It's based on 1,124 visits. So some of these men are on active surveillance. So every year we're obtaining a multiparametric MRI and biopsy. Um, as I mentioned, some of these men have negative MRIs, and we have a total of 1,500 uh, total lesions that we can look at. So what I want to show here is we're looking at les lesion suspicion level correlates with cancer detection. So PIRADS 2, 3, 4, and 5. So you see as you increase the lesion, uh, the detection lesion or the PIRADS reading, the detection of sig clinically significant cancer, which we define as Gleason 3 plus 4 or higher, correlates to the PIRADS reading. We also believe that targeted biopsies give us better risk stratification. So this is a little bit of a tough slide to read. Many of you maybe know how to read these, but let me just walk you through this and see if I can actually explain it. So this is based on 955 patients. So this is the data on 955 patients. All these patients had a target that could be targeted. So that none of these patients had a negative MRI. You then ask the question, the question in this three by three readout, 
is how well did the ultrasound or systematic, the 12 cores, do relative to target? Because every patient gets a targeted and a systematic biopsy. So we get one through 12, normal <coughs> target, and then every, tar every lesion that gets targeted, those are biopsies 13 and higher. If you had perfect correlation between the ultrasound and the targeted, all the data would line up on this diagonal. If there's a discrepancy, you populate these quadrants. We're only interested, really, in clinically significant prostate cancer, so we're gonna focus in on that. So that's three plus four or higher. So in this cohort of 955 men, 429 had Gleason 7 or higher. The question then is, how well did the targeted biopsy do in detecting Gleason 7 disease in those men? Targeted, Gleason 7, it recognized or identified 385 men with Gleason 7 disease or higher, but it did miss 45. So it has a 10% were missed of cancers missed by targeted biopsy. Similarly, if we ask on ultrasound, ultrasound identified 289 patients with Gleason 7 or higher disease, but it missed 140 patients that had Gleason 7 disease. So 32% of the clinically significant cancers were missed by the ultrasound. So targeted biopsy misses less significant cancer. This is also our data. Again, now we're just looking at targeted lesions, and we broke up our data based on the biopsy history. Again, I think when you look at this, so just these are the three different cohorts of the, uh, our ultimate uh, subset, or I'm sorry, three different subsets of our cohort. And you can see, again, we demonstrate that as you increase your PIRADS reading, you increase your detection of significant cancer, which is in red. Blue is benign, green is Gleason 6 disease. And that's the case for all three of these uh, biopsy histories. In the yellow box, these are patients who are on active surveillance. And what we see is, again, there's a correlation with PIRADS, but there's a, high, there's a high frequency of Gleason 6 disease, which makes sense because 90% or so of our patients on active surveillance have Gleason 6 disease. These are patients who have had prior negative biopsies. So they're, they're sent to us, elevated PSA, had undergone template biopsies in the, uh, outside of Yale, and they were all negative. We bring them in, do an MRI, and then biopsy. And what's interesting here is, again, there's correlation with PIRADS, but in the PIRADS 2 and 3, we detect very little, less cancer, less cancer in the PIRADS 2 and 3 lesions than we do in the others. And then this group here are those patients who we're seeing for the first time who were able to convince insurance to allow us to get an MRI and then do a targeted biopsy. And so they're, they're biopsy naive. And what's impressive here is of those patients, those with PIRADS 5 lesions, 87% had clinically significant cancer. We also ask the question, if someone comes in and has more than one clinically, uh, has more than one PIRADS 4 or 5 lesion, are they more likely to have clinically significant cancer? And the answer is yes. We have three groups. Group 1, single PIRADS lesion. Group 2, PIRADS 4 plus a lower grade PIRADS, 2 or 3. And then group 3 is they have a PIRADS 4 plus a PIRADS 4 or 5 lesion. So when you see men who have multiple PIRADS 4 or 5 lesions, the likelihood of detecting cancer is, is very significant. So this is just an example of a patient that presented to Yale. Prior negative biopsy, PSA rose to 13.9. We obtained our MRI. We did the systematic, syst syst uh, systematic 12 core biopsy. All were negative. We then did targeted uh, biopsies. We took seven cores, two of them positive for four plus three. The region of interest was identified in the anterior um, mid zone. So an area that's outside normally of a template biopsy. So conclusions, targeted biopsy detects fewer Gleason 6 cancers. Targeted biopsy detects more Gleason 7 cancers. And the biopsies, our recommendations, should still include systematic sampling for maximal high-grade cancer detection, because remember, we still miss 10% with targeted alone. And I think there's several reasons for this. I think the MRIs are not perfect. We have a mapping um, issue, and we also have a targeting issue with the device. We need to be better. I think deformation plays a role, and we have an NIH grant looking at that. And improved targeting techniques will allow the opportunity in the future to reduce detection of inhalant disease through the avoidance of systematic biopsy. What are the benefits of multiparametric MRI targeted biopsy? It decreases the underdetection of significant cancer, it decreases the overdetection of low grade cancer, and it improves our monitoring for active surveillance. So remember, we're not screening to treat, we're screening to detect. The future, hopefully, is we suspect 
prostate cancer in an individual, we obtain a multiparametric MRI. If it's negative, there's no action. If it's positive, we do a targeted biopsy only. If it's low risk disease, active surveillance. If it's high risk, intermediate or high, we treat. Thank you very much.